Are we alone in the universe? This has been one of the biggest questions in human history. From the days of ancient Egypt to the modern age, from the Mayans in the West to the Chinese in the East, every single civilization in the world has looked up at the horizon and wondered, what else was there? We created mythologies, studied the sky, developed math, science and technology, all to try and explain it, to hunt for answers. And ever since we've learned that our solar system isn't the only one with planets, that in fact, many stars appear to have rocky planets just like our own, astronomers have been looking for life blooming on Earth 2.0. Thanks to some clever physics, powerful telescopes and brilliant minds, we are now even able to see an exoplanet's atmosphere from light years away and discover the chemicals of life. Turns out, the answer for the big question might come far sooner than we think. As we explained in a previous video, all light is made of photons. Massless particles that carry the electromagnetic force, they make up the electromagnetic spectrum, the range of wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation going from mild radio waves all the way to powerful gamma rays. Right in the middle of this vast spectrum, there's visible light, the wavelengths we are able to perceive with the naked eye. When we see an object, we are seeing the light bouncing off it. Different objects and elements reflect different wavelengths based on the size and shape of their structures. On Earth, most life uses some kind of pigment to reflect specific colours, like the green chlorophyll in plants, orange carotene in carrots, or brown melanin in humans. Others, like the morpho butterfly, are more clever. They shape their wings with elaborate, microscopic structures tailor-made to capture certain wavelengths of light while reflecting others. This is called structural coloration and it produces vibrant colours, often blue, that change reflectiveness depending on the viewing angle. Living organisms, however, aren't the only things in the universe capable of having colour. Going more basic than that, different molecules and chemical elements can have their own shades. Scientists have even figured out a way to study and identify different elements based on the precise wavelengths of photons they absorb or emit. That study is called spectroscopy. Physics and chemistry have taught us that different chemical elements have different numbers of electrons inside them, layered in multiple energy levels. These electrons are organised in shells, and each one of them can move to higher and lower energy states if given enough energy. But that's the catch. Only specific amounts of energy can make an electron jump from level to level, give it any more or any less and it won't work. And that amount changes from element to element, since each shell is distinct from the last. If you shoot electrons at hydrogen atoms, you'll see them emit light at very particular wavelengths. Repeat the same experiment with helium, and you'll get different wavelengths, and so on. By combining these emissions in a line, you get their emission spectra. Do these experiments long enough with different elements and molecules, and you can build a database containing each one's fingerprint. Since photons behave a lot like electrons, and light is basically pure energy, you can apply this technique to any star, planet, or nebula in the universe. In 1802, physicist William Hyde Wollaston realised that when divided using a prism, sunlight's colours weren't spread uniformly, but instead had missing patches of colours, which appeared as dark bands in the sun's spectrum. Later in the 19th century, using the many advancements done in the field during previous decades, William and Margaret Huggins used spectroscopy to determine that the stars were composed of the same elements as found on Earth. They were also the first to distinguish nebulae from stars. By using spectral techniques to analyse light from the Cat's Eye Nebula, NGC 6543. By the beginning of the 1900s, thanks to the outstanding work of people like the Harvard Computers, a team of skilled astronomers tasked with analysing and classifying astronomical data, we had a catalogue so large that scientists were able to create an entire diagram dividing thousands of stars into spectral classes based on their luminosity and surface temperature all by looking at their light and comparing it with what we already knew about spectral lines. And for the longest time, that's as far as we could see. 
until the 1990s, when technology evolved to the point where we began finding planets orbiting other stars. Over the years, scientists have used many methods to detect exoplanets. The first ones were found when a pulsar, a type of neutron star known for its microsecond precision, inexplicably slowed down its pulses from time to time. Another way is to search for deviances in the star's distance from Earth, using its light's wavelengths. But the most technical and most useful, if you want to find alien life, is the transit method. When a planet passes in front of its parent star, the star's light is blocked a little. That effect is extremely faint, since stars are usually hundreds of times larger and brighter than their surrounding planets. However, if you have a telescope sensitive enough, you can detect such almost imperceptible dips. In fact, from more than 4,400 exoplanets confirmed so far in missions such as Kepler and TESS, about 75% have been detected using this technique. So you could say astronomers have gotten pretty good at spotting passing exoplanets. But what's so great about this transition method? During transit, light from the star passes through the upper atmosphere of the planet. By studying the high resolution stellar spectrum carefully, we can detect elements present in the planet's atmosphere. That means we can use spectroscopy to see if the planet has liquid water or even complex carbon molecules that could indicate the presence of alien life. This isn't sci-fi. This is done using current technologies. Space agencies have even launched telescopes with this exact purpose, and the next generation of telescopes will look even deeper into the sky to find planets with atmospheres like our own. The Kepler Space Telescope was launched by NASA in 2009 with the express mission to discover Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars. It looked into a fixed part of the sky, continuously monitoring the brightness of approximately 150,000 main-sequence stars for any dimming caused by exoplanet transit. Over its more than nine years of operation, the telescope detected 2,662 planets, several of them in their stars' habitable zones. In 2018, it was time for NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS for short, to launch, trading Kepler's larger single mirror and fixed field of view to multiple smaller mirrors with a much larger field of view, along with an orbit that allows the telescope to eventually look at the entire sky. Since its launch, TESS has identified 2,601 candidate exoplanets, of which 122 have been confirmed so far. And because it looks at the entire sky, it's able to find planets orbiting stars much brighter than the ones Kepler discovered, making them far more suitable for atmospheric spectral analysis. But technology and rocket payload sizes have evolved greatly since these two launched, so over the course of the next few years we'll see the development of larger and more sensitive projects. With an estimated launch window in 2026, the European Space Agency's Plateau Space Telescope is looking to mix the best of both Kepler and TESS. Plateau will have 26 independent telescopes compared to TESS's four. These multiple lenses will allow it to look at a wider angle in the sky like TESS, and their increased size and number will put the telescope's resolution on par with Kepler. Its mission will also be a hybrid. Like TESS, it'll have a larger field of view and target Earth-sized planets around bright stars. And like Kepler, it will stare at patches of sky long enough to be sensitive to Earth-sized planets on year-long orbits around Sun-like stars. Later in 2028, ESA is planning a follow-up mission with Ariel, a telescope built specifically to look at known exoplanets during their transit and analyse their atmospheres. It'll be the first dedicated mission to measure the chemical composition and thermal structures of hundreds of transiting exoplanets. And finally, we have the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's greatest challenge so far and the nightmare of many engineers, which aims to finally launch later this year after almost a decade delayed. Although a general-purpose telescope much like Hubble before it, it will commit some of its time to look at exoplanets as well. And with a mirror of 6.5 metres in diameter, six times Hubble's in area, James Webb will be able to detect much fainter objects and changes in wavelengths, promising to revolutionise astronomy as a whole, including the search for alien life. However, by the end of this decade, even the mighty JWST might find itself on the smaller size of greater, more ambitious projects. But that's a story for another day.
The origin of astronomy goes all the way to the earliest days of human society, and we can see how each generation adds new discoveries and knowledge to it. From the ancient Greeks writing down the movement of the planets in the solar system, to the Harvard computers creating a catalogue of stars which became the basis for stellar spectroscopy throughout the 20th century, and on to the very nearby future of telescopes able to directly see alien chemistry in distant planets. You may even wake up tomorrow and see all over the news a headline saying we finally found alien life. It's an exciting time to be alive. Thanks for joining us this week in Access Astronomy. We hope to see you back here next week as we continue to explore our strange and vast universe.